Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Music Supervisor Roundtable. Uh, this is a panel discussion that is part of the United Masters Select Conference. My name is Mario Davis. I run the Music Licensing and Sync Department at United Masters. Um, I will be the moderator for today's discussion. Uh, today, we're joined by four of the most highly accomplished music supervisors uh, in the industry. Uh, Morgan Rhodes, Madonna Wade Reed, Jen Malone, and uh, Barry Cole. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, Morgan uh, is the music supervisor on the movie Selma, which famously featured the song Glory by John Legend and Common, uh, which won the Oscar for Best Original Song. She's also extremely well known for her work on the show uh, Dear White People. Uh, Madonna is perhaps best known for her work on uh, all kinds of TV shows, including All American, Batwoman, Rain, uh, American Crime, which is a personal favorite of mine, and uh, of course, Smallville. Um, Jen, equally notably, has uh, worked on um, various different uh, critically acclaimed and highly regarded film and TV projects as well, including the FX series Atlanta, the HBO series Euphoria, and of course uh, the film Creed II, uh, among many, many other credits. And last but certainly not least, um, Barry has an equally storied career uh, um, dating back to uh, projects such as Belly, American Psycho, Drumline, Roll Bounce, Movie Notorious, and uh, of course, the, the ever popular Showtime series, uh, The Shy, which is set in my hometown of Chicago. Um, so let's, let's dive right in here. Uh, again, thank you all for, uh, for being a part of this today. I um, kind of want to start off by mentioning something about the, the term music supervisor. I always kind of felt that uh, that term didn't really fully encapsulate what it is that you all uh, kind of do and, and that you're actually in charge of. I always felt like the term was a bit misleading, that it's kind of a misnomer because it somehow, at least in my mind, implies that there's uh, almost like a, a, like a passive aspect to the work that you do when in reality, uh, you know, oftentimes you're much more hands-on than that uh, kind of generic term would really uh, indicate. Um, so if you would, uh, Madonna, why don't you get us started here? If you could just quickly, um, you know, give us a uh, a description of the of the of the you know basic work that a music supervisor does, and 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 also um, how that role has uh, perhaps fundamentally changed over the course of, of of your career. Well, first of all, you're making me wish that I had actually printed out sort of the official guild, <laughs> which which I will say this. It's more than a page long when you talk about what a supervisor does. It's actually right. much longer than a, um, a lot of people recognize it to be. And there's a lot of duties and skills and a skill set that a lot of people don't recognize are necessary to do what we do. We're not just people who listen to music and know what's good and what's bad. Um, you know, our entire job is to help tell a story and our role is the one of the musical character and we have to create just like any actor has to create their character and any director has to have an overview of the story that they're telling and how to best tell it and what to put on screen we're tasked with the same thing but we do it orally um everything from understanding what's on paper to translating it to screen to, you know, dropping in needle drop songs, but also creating original songs, overseeing the recording of original songs, making sure that everything that we create is handled in the manner we envisioned when it reaches post, making sure it goes right on set, I think, which is why we we're talking about health and safety. We actually are required to be on set to make sure that all the union rules are followed when we are doing something music related with you know, musicians and stuff. Um, and I think the role has changed. I think I've been doing this over 20 years. And from when I started, you know, people just wanted us to pick songs, pick a song for this scene in the cafe, 
pick a song for this scene, um, a love scene in a movie. It was, it was much more rudimentary and it grew and it grew exponentially. And I think I look at what I was doing 20 years ago and I look at what I'm doing now and I don't sit in my office with headphones and just pick songs. I am, as all of us are, heads together with our directors, with our producers, and even graduated to a point where I have conversations with content creators and some of my ideas, all of our ideas can sometimes be incorporated into a script and a storyline where they didn't exist before. Um, recently, I am a part of pre-production meetings. People have realized that music is important and if you have a conversation with a director or a producer before you start the production, it actually tends to go a lot more smoothly if you're all on the same page day one and you're not all trying to figure it out day 90. So it's changed a great deal. I, I don't think we're where I would like us to be, but I think the respect for what we do has grown and the number of tasks we take on has grown. I see. Yeah. So um, I think uh, I think there is a, a sense in which the um, the complete role of a music supervisor has uh, has definitely uh, changed, probably dramatically. You know, in the last uh, decade or so, maybe even you know longer than that. And I'm sure even from project to project, um, the tasks that you're asked asked to oversee and the specific nature of your role probably differs um, both from project to project and I'm sure even on a, a daily basis. So uh, Barry, Jen, um, and Morgan, um, really interested to, to kind of get your, your take on that question uh, as well in terms of, um, you know, uh, how you kind of envision uh, your role both in, in projects maybe that you're working on currently or recently or just, uh, you know, since your, your career began. Jen, you want to go ahead? So I'm sorry. So how how my job has changed? Uh, yes. Well, I, I started working in reality television. And reality TV just works so different from scripted. Um, mainly, you don't have a script. So you don't know what's kind of going to happen because reality is kind of not really reality TV. But um, making that transition into scripted has just been, you know, a lot of people just kind of rely on us on all those um, duties that Madonna was mentioning, but also I think, you know, making sure, um, you know, learning how to do clearances for if somebody's watching a movie on the screen uh, in the show and then knowing that, you know, clearing that music behind the clip kind of falls on your shoulders. So it's just, it, it's just, it's, it's overseeing the music department as a whole, every aspect of music that goes into the production. I think for me, I started my career in film. So one of the ways that my career has changed is that I, got into television, so I had to make an adjustment. I had to adjust to the pace um, of television, which is, is much faster um, than film. I had a long lead time to sort of dig and dig for music, and I came to this career through radio, so I was sort of used to being a DJ and digging and just having, you know, unlimited time to dig. When I started working on television, I, I really fully understood the word fast. Um, everything has to happen fast. Um, clearances have to happen fast. And it sort of informed uh, the conversations that I had because we're moving. Um, to that end, I think it was, it, it, it helped me. It was a great learning curve. Um, I think we, we all need to, to, to adjust to the projects that we're given. And so having a, a show with 13 episodes was sort of my entrance into uh, the, the world of TV scheduling. And, uh, and I, I, the jury's still out. I don't know which one I like better. I think TV's got a lot of uh, short-term gratification. People tweet about your shows and tweet about the music, so that's cool. Uh, but I love having a little bit more time. So I can say that, that, that what I do has changed dramatically from the, 
from just going from the transition from film to television. Sure. Barry, what about you? Um, I believe, and I followed a similar path to Morgan. I started as a DJ, worked in radio, and my first job was in feature films. And there was a rhythm and a pace and kind of an intimacy to working on features and being there with a team and going scene by scene um, that I do kind of miss uh, as the pace of episodic has just really just turned everything up a number of notches. I remember the first reality show I worked on was called G-String Divas. It was Patty <laughs> Poplin's predecessor to real sex. And, you know, when I'm getting quotes, people don't know how to charge. And it was just interesting to be part of this new wave of content where the music hasn't changed, the rights holders haven't changed, but there's a, a pause while everyone figures out how they're gonna charge for it or what's going to happen. And it happened similarly with uh, Alpha House, um, which was one of the first Amazon digital shows. So it's been interesting to kind of watch those waves of having new content, having it go to new places or having it not go to the traditional places and still having the experience of the industry adjusting. And I feel like just as, you know, the industry on the rights holder side and also on the production side has changed, I feel like the music supervisor is constantly kind of shape-shifting along with that. Uh, Barry, you mentioned a second ago um, the issue of, uh, of kind of knowing what to charge or, or what to quote for, uh, for a given piece of music. Uh, let's talk a little bit about budgets, both in, in fil film and TV. How has that landscape also kind of shifted over the years, over the last four or five or six years, or you can even you know pick a, a longer time frame? And, uh, and a related question, what impact have those budgets had on um, the types of music you've um, you know had to, to choose from? Um, both in situations where you've had kind of larger music budgets to work with and, and also situations where maybe your budgets have been a little bit more limited and have uh, forced you to kind of get more, more creative and dig a little bit deeper uh, in terms of the, the types of artists whose music you license. Um, Madonna? Um, well, first... The, I think the first part of your question was about our budgets and how they change. <clears throat> um, I think they've actually gone down a great deal. I can remember five, 10 years ago having more money than I sometimes have now. Um, but maybe, you know, certainly in television, it's a lot more, a lot more money is spent just on the production. And because you're one of the last tasks tackled in television sometimes when there's when someone needs to steal money, you're the only one that has it, so they steal it from you. Mm -hmm. um, while the budgets have changed, and I don't wanna you know, screw it up for anybody else, I'm kinda not that bothered. <laughs> and I'm not bothered, not because it means I can't afford music. I can always afford music because there's always music out there. Um, the biggest thing that it's changed certainly for me is, you know, everybody wants to help you do their job. Like if you know how to play the radio in your car, you must know how to pick songs. And the one thing that I sort of, and I'm naughty for saying this, but the one thing that I enjoy is by having a great reduction in your budget, the people who are helping you and basing it on their little teeny tiny iTunes and their car radio, chances are you can't afford their ideas. And for me, that's where the fun begins because my ideas aren't on the radio necessarily. Mm. Um, I don't mind having a smaller budget because to me, that's my invitation to, as Morgan says, even though TV doesn't allow for it, to do a little more digging and to be a little more independent in my choices. And for me, I have just the utmost respect for viewers. And I don't always feel like they need to hear a song they know to support what's happening on screen. Mm -hmm. I'm much more excited about people. If you are reaching over to get your phone and Shazam while you're watching something, one of us is done. That's a hell of a lot more exciting to me than when you hear a song and you go, oh yeah, remember when we heard it in that movie? That, no, thank you. I, my thing is, you're gonna challenge me with my budget? 
or I'm going to give you double over. I'm going to give you a new experience. And the next time you hear this song, you're going to say, I remember when I heard it on the show that Morgan was working. I heard it on Dear White People first. I heard it on All American first. I heard it on Euphoria first. That's what I'm chasing. And if you want to take away my money, that doesn't get in the way of me achieving that. You know, so maybe it's a bad thing to say, but I'm not going to get beat myself up if you trim money off my budget from one season to the next, because I'm going to still find some really good music. And your money is not going to determine what's good and what's not and what's right and what's not. You raised some really great points there. It's kind of become a somewhat of a, um, a uh, uh, truism at this point, and maybe a little bit of a cliche, but in a very real sense, I think what you're getting at is that the music supervisor has kind of become the new A&R, uh, kind of become the new uh, radio DJ as far as being a, a source, and even maybe in some cases for a lot of people, a primary source of new music discovery uh, for fan, fans of music through the shows that they watch, and the, the content that they, uh, that they engage with. Um, so uh, what I would love to know related to that is where are you finding music? Um, and, uh, and also if you could share some stories about uh, some artists that you've kind of helped discover through your creative music process that you've placed in a show or a film and an anecdote or two about uh, how that placement uh, kind of became meaningful to them and kind of help shape maybe even like uh, their overall career trajectory and put them on a, a different different path and give them access to kind of a whole new fan base potentially. Uh, Jen, that's, that's for you. Um, I mean, there's been a couple that have been really exciting. I mean, I think one of the biggest ones was the Megan the Stallion in Euphoria. And how that came about was um, originally they had Cardi B in there and she's a nightmare to clear because of splits and obviously she was going to be super expensive. So to Madonna's point, we couldn't afford her anyway. So it was one of those things where, you know, I had to, it was, it was the first episode. It was a new show. My editors and I were new. Sam and I were kind of, you know, getting, building that trust. And it was just like, trust me guys, like, just please put this in, just trust me on this one. And it was extremely affordable at the time. And when we were at the final mix, Sam was so excited to tell me that the, the cast had been listening to Megan Thee Stallion and were so excited to hear that it was in the show. So that was, and then obviously, you know, when, when the show premiered, I would say, I think it was like 25% of the tweets were about music. And out of that 20% was out of the Megan Thee Stallion placement. Um, on the other end of that, I know that in the finale, we had the Donny Hathaway song. And it turned out that that, was, that song was trending on Twitter, or Donny Hathaway was trending on Twitter that night and the next day. Um, the song was like number one on Shazam. And it's what, from... 60s I don't even know when it was recorded 70s maybe so as far as even introducing something new and breaking something uh breaking an artist or song, breaking an artist or a song like Megan Thee Stallion but then also reintroducing uh an artist like Donny Hathaway both of those had such an enormous like payoff for 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 myself and our whole team of like wow we're 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 giving the experience and we're introducing new music to a new like generation of kids that were, that were obsessed and, and watching the show. So it, those, those were two that I was really proud of. And then in Atlanta, you know, having Kodak black in the first, uh, in the season one, which was what, like four or five years ago now. Um, and then take a, so a lot of the younger independent hip hop artists, um, you know, making beats in their bedrooms and then really getting this placement just to kind of really, really strongly help their career. That's great. Uh, Morgan and Barry, I would love to also get your take on uh, this notion of uh, breaking new artists or introducing or reintroducing le legacy acts uh, through, through, uh, through sync and through, uh, through placements. I think for me, uh, my how I look at my job is the same way I looked at being on the radio. 
uh, came up in public radio. So you had to create your own playlist. There wasn't a top 40. And so I prepare for shows the same way. Um, the payoff for me is, is always being able to break an artist. And because I started out indie, I still have that feeling. And, uh, and usually those choices are also informed by budget. But that's the best part of it for me is the discovery part. And I've told this story a lot about an artist named James Tillman. I had to replace a, uh, an end credit song by a major artist that everybody fell in love with. And I was like, oh Lord, you know, what are you gonna do? And it was one of those nights where just, I, I didn't have any submissions that were making sense. So I did what I always do. And I was like, time to go in your own crates. And I remembered uh, a three track EP that I had heard by this artist and he just released uh, an album. It was crunch time. And I just thought, let me, let me see if he'll answer the phone. And he did answer the phone, which blew my mind. I was, just broke down my story to him. This is what we need. And then I pitched it and it was perfect um, for the moment. He had never had a placement before. Um, he got it. He turned around everything really quickly. Another miracle. It was just miracle after miracle. And what happened to him afterwards was one, his Spotify streams went through the roof. Um, I get asked about that song. I think I've gotten asked about that song, you know, a hundred times. And that was three years ago. He's been able to tour, um, record another album. And it was just a three track EP that he had on Bandcamp. And so for me, that's sort of the joy of the job. And I want to keep doing that. I would rather have someone say, who was that? As opposed to that's my jam. Mm -hmm. I want someone to ask who was that? So, I, so it gives me an opportunity to talk about the, the artist. So. I tend to skew indie because the fun of it is 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 finding someone that could really benefit by by having a placement. And as as uh, Madonna and Jenna both said, those rare opportunities mean the world to someone who really could use and deserves a placement and someone that nobody's heard of. So, so yeah. Um, that's great, Barry. What about you? I. You know, I've always had a passion for putting music to picture and it doesn't necessarily have to be new and it doesn't necessarily have to be well known. And over the years, um, I guess a couple of things that stick out are um, the song, I was working on a film called Beauty Shop, uh, which was a Queen Latifah show. <laughs> it was actually Beauty Shop, uh, Barbershop 3. Um, and I remember I was driving around LA and I heard a song on the radio and I was like, that's it. And, you know, I think it was Felly Fell and he's like, you know, this is a hairdresser from out of Atlanta and we're just leaking this early. And I'm like, I got to call the state. You know, it's just, it's that excitement. You know, it's like, I called the station. They told me, oh, somebody came from Atlanta and they played that personally. They're like, give me his name. So, well, we don't know who that is, but this guy who brought him here, you know, you might be able to, and literally I went through everyone from Roadrunner to Jackie Chan to Homer Simpson. And I ended up with a guy named Michael Jackson. Ah. And I was like, did you come to LA and did you play like a song from like a hairdresser? I'm working on a film called Beauty Shop. I think like it would be really, really great. And he's like, oh yeah, that song. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, we're not really doing anything with it yet. So I'm glad to get some sort of traction. So you know, let's see, you know, what you got. And I was like, we don't have a lot of money, but I think it'd be a really good vehicle. And I remember going into the producer and the director and kind of be like, this is the song. And they were like, yeah, it's all right. I'm like, what do you mean it's all right? This is not, this is the song. They're like, yeah, well, okay, maybe if we speed it up a little bit, it'd be all right. So at that time, there was a soundtrack deal that was being spoken about by uh, Island Records. So Chris Blackwell had kind of come in and was like watching the film and talking to him about music and stuff. And there's this song and he's like, I really like that song. So he took that song and he went and played it for his friend, Doug Morris. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, there's a group called the Pussycat Dolls, <laughs> a song called Don't Ya. And I was like, but that's, but, but that's the hairdresser and, that, and that's the song and, and that's the thing. And, you know, and there's just those little moments where it's like, I knew when I heard that song on the radio that it was going to be amazing. I didn't get a lot of support through it, but the song did end up in the film. And 
the Pussycat Dolls went on to do what Pussycat Dolls do. <laughs> That's amazing. So, you know, in terms of just a story of being there and putting pieces together and being happy about like, oh, yeah, I remember that song when it was by a hairdresser instead of, you know, the, the group that Doug Morris signed and said, I need a vehicle for this song, for this group. Um, in terms of one of the older songs and working on season one of The Shy, you know, the, the whole series starts off with the killing of a young man in Chicago, and it deals with the stories of his family, you know, coping with that death. And there's a song called uh, Brother, Where Are You? by Oscar Brown Jr., mm -hmm. who is also from Chicago. And that's a song that I grew up listening to. You know, it was something that my parents had. And having lost my brother myself, that was one of those songs that just connecting with the show and putting it in and watching it play and being able to use it in the first episode, but also being able to use it in the finale for a longer stretch. That's something that really connected with me. And, you know, at a certain point, you're kind of caught up in the show and you, you're doing it for the audience, but you're not really sure who's listening or what the response was. But yeah, the next day being able to see that song trending and Oscar Brown, like, you know, being played like that, that really made me feel good. Uh, so I think we've shown that uh, music supervisors love discovering new talents and love, you know, having the opportunity to break new artists and to expose them to a whole new uh, set of, of, of new audiences. Um, so the, the newness element is, is kind of one major factor, uh, clearly, in terms of uh, your overall creative decision making process. What are I'm curious to know what are some of the those other either tangible or maybe like intangible musical or non musical qualities, if you will, that either you naturally gravitate towards uh, when you're kind of listening through music that you've been pitched or music that you're, you know, uh, doing your kind of your own independent search, looking for the, the perfect song for the, the, the you know, a moment in a, in a film or TV show, uh, whether it be, um, you know, kind of melodic elements or different types of production or different genres uh, that, you know, in general, uh, you're, you're, you're drawn to, um, would love to just kind of hear your thoughts on what are some of those those other elements that um you know may maybe not uh are conscious to you when you're listening to uh to you know through through uh through a playlist but that you kind of know it uh when you when you hear it that um that this song is going to be kind of perfect for this specific scene or even if i don't have you know something to um uh, you know, a, a slot for this this song right now, somewhere down the road in some future project. I, I feel like this this is going to work for for something eventually. Madonna, you want to take that one? Yeah. Everyone knows what I'm doing when I do this, right? <laughs> yep. Goosebumps. Are, yeah, goosebumps. We have a very highly professional and very technically astute system that somehow <laughs> helps us know that it's the right song and. I think we have all at some point run into an edit base screaming like, I, I had like, this is the right song. Like this happened. And then you sit there and you watch them put it to picture and you're like, Oh God, I hope the other four people in the room get it. I mean, it is the most basic, easiest way to know something's right. And I think it's born out of, I think people who do what we do were wired a little different when we hear music. And one of the things that, you know, and guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the things that I feel like we have an innate ability to spot is something that is not organic and not true. If somebody is performing and creating a song because they think that's what they're supposed to create as opposed to this is what they were meant to create, that's, that's the difference between the goosebumps. If you create something you were meant to create, if you have a true connection sometimes to the story that you're telling, we're wired. We get it. And it shows up on our skin that everything organically was in the right place for it to happen. And by the same terms, you don't want to see what we look like when we call BS on something we hear. And we can hear. <laughs> We can hear if it's not authentic. I mean, that's, I think, 
where we come from is we want to be authentic. And we're not going to do anything that doesn't feel right. We're not going to do anything that doesn't sound right. We're not going to do anything that's not right for our project. So when the sun and the moon and all those things align, song in. I want to drill down on that uh, concept of authentic versus uh, not authentic a little bit further. Um, can you provide some examples of, uh, of what that means? Um, are, are you? I assume you're, you're referring to artists who are just naturally committing, com uh, creating music that just kind of springs from their own in, in, internal sources of inspiration um, and, uh, you know, feel compelled to, to create a song that, um, that speaks to certain, uh, you know, kind of personal creative needs that they have to express themselves versus maybe songs that are specifically written just for sync purposes that have, you know, certain lyrics or types of instrumentation or, or types of production because they think that that, that type of that style of, of song is going to land them a, a big placement. Correct. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule out songs written for sync because one of the, I want to say advancements in people having more respect and taking more seriously what we do is we are all offered on many occasions now the opportunity to step into a room full of songwriters and tell them what we want. And you might not necessarily get what you were hoping for, but if the story you're trying to tell and you share with a group of songwriters and producers resonates with even one of them, then it's worth a spin on the wheel that you might get something really amazing back. You know, you Got might, it. might need one little lyric, you know, I, I had a song written for Batwoman that uh, I'd had a conversation. I was sort of not struggling, but I wanted to be really respectful of the fact that there was a lesbian relationship in this series. And I wanted to really honor who was on screen and who was going to create the soundtrack for that relationship. And I wanted to be as authentic as I could in that. Sure. There's a million songs that work for love relationships, but I was like, F it. I want, I want a song where someone knows exactly who they're, who's going to be on screen when this is heard. And I had a, a talk with a songwriter and two producers. And I said to them, what does it feel like? And this is pretty universal. When you see someone you had a relationship with and for all the saddest and wrong reasons it ended, there's this flurry of thoughts that go through your head when you see them. First, you think about what it was. Then you think about what it could have been. And then you think about what it'll never be. And I walked out of the room and she wrote the most incredible love song and she sort of said, like, it'll never be. So, I mean, you can spin that wheel and get really lucky, but it was authentic. And I was, you know, I walked out of the room and I was trying to respect songwriters and what they do and not say too much or like, like, you do you. Like, I'm just, this is what I need. You do your version of it. And just to be a jerk as I walked out of the room, I look back and I was like, oh, by the way, I have no problem with whatever pronouns you want to use. And she wrote the song and it was she and it was her the whole way. And when I heard it, I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And I was like, I couldn't type fast enough to send it to my showrunner creator, Carolyn. I was like, oh my God, oh my God. Like it worked, it worked. So when it works, it really works. I think what you're describing there goes back to what I was saying earlier about music supervisors really and truly being the new A&Rs. And I'm sure a lot of those little tricks and, and, and tactics and strategies that you just <laughs> described are ones that, you know, top A&Rs uh, are, you know, famous for, for using. And I'm sure they could, uh, you know, steal a few uh, plays out of your, 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 your playbook. Um, I do want to shift gears uh, uh, to kind of address, you know, the, the elephant in the room, you know, we're obviously conducting this this panel discussion on on Zoom. Uh, we're speaking virtually here today. Uh, you know, under normal circumstances, we would have all been on a dais or 
you know, talking you know, in, in person, you know, somewhere in a, in, a, in a conference room or in a conference hall, having this, this same kind of discussion. Um, so, you know, we have a global pandemic obviously happening right now. Uh, and, you know, there's also a, uh, a tremendous amount of, you know, civil and, and social upheaval, you know, going on simultaneously, both in this country and, and, and around the world. First on the, you know, the, the point of kind of our new living and, and work circumstances related to COVID-19, Jen would love to know how, you know, this new normal is uh, directly or indirectly kind of impacting uh, your workflow, the, the types of projects, um, you know, that you had been, been planning to work on that may have possibly been on, been on hold. Um, so feel free to take it from there. Yeah, we were we were supposed to start shooting Euphoria season two, March 16th, the day we went into lockdown. And that was, you know, it sucks right now. I mean, Atlanta's been pushed back. I mean, I had five shows that were going to start shooting like April, March, April, May, June. And they're all just at a standstill and everybody's kind of like not really sure. Um, they... Sam Levinson, the director, writer, creator of Euphoria, um, he ended up writing a movie and it just, it stars just Zendaya and John David Washington. And that was just shot. And it was just two people. It was the first feature film that was shot during the pandemic. So that's been to be a part of that and, and see what everything, the, the laundry list of stuff that has to happen in order for the, film to be shot um you know was it was intense and obviously I, I there was a couple on cameras and stuff i had to deal with but i i was not on set i didn't even ask i don't want to go to set <laughs> um so it's just kind of it's a lot of a waiting game but i am trying to use my time wisely um as far as, you know, yes, listening to new music and taking that time to dig, but really go through the crates, as Morgan and Barry said, just kind of finding a lot of old shit and kind of getting um, my library sorted with, you know, with, with whether it's 30s music or, you know, 70s mm-hmm. jazz, obscure stuff, like just really trying to find some of that stuff that... Um, you know, kind of going back to your last question of, you know, you, you know it when you hear it. And so hearing a song that's like, this song is amazing. I have nothing to put it in now, but mm-hmm. I have a, I have a folder that's kind of like my someday sinks. So really trying to find a lot of, of that music just to kind of stash away. Um, it's just, it's hard right now. And I think because I feed off of, personally, I feed off of like having a million things to do and just, you know, just like getting in the zone and going all day to not really having that pressure, you know, on a personal level, you get into your head and it's really, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. And, you know, just trying to kind of also be there as a support system for, for my friends and my colleagues that are, we're all in the same boat. And it's all very uncertain and it's uh, very heavy. I want to go back to work, but I want everybody to be safe. I want everybody, I want everybody to be able to go back to work and do what we love to do. Um, Creating, you know, creating music, film and television that resonate with people that is an escape or what have you. And, and to not be able to do that is, it sucks. <laughs> it sucks. At least for me. Um, so, yeah, so obviously the current circumstances have had a major impact on all of us, um, you know, both on the business side of the industry and obviously uh, on the creative side as well. And for, for artists, um, you know, it's it's been said many times that, uh, you know, during times of change, artists step up and they create music that uh, reflect the era uh, that they're living in. Uh, so Morgan, I'm, I'm curious to know from you if there are any 
uh, specific or general kind of patterns in the types of music that you're seeing artists put out these days, uh, kind of in light of, you know, both everything that were going on uh, globally, as well as, you know, more specifically to the point um, in terms of the, the sort of, you know, resurgent uh, social justice movement uh, that has been sparked. Um, uh, and in light of, you know, all the, uh, the, the, the protests that, that, have, that have been happening uh, around the country globally. Um, do you see that as, as having an influence or an impact on the types of music or the, uh, the, the overall vibe or, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of musical themes of, of music that artists are, are putting out these days? Do you see any, any trends there? I think the trends are twofold. I think there's a return to um, some of the some of the protest songs and civil rights songs of, of of old, but I also think that since 2015, and of course 2015 was when uh, Kendrick Lamar had a, a "We Gonna Be All Right," and mm -hmm. that quickly became a social justice anthem. And I think it sort of changed the landscape to the degree that there doesn't have to be one song, there can be several songs, and the song doesn't necessarily have to be tailored to the movement, it can just apply. I mean, I, I heard at several marches, uh, people singing that, you about to lose your job, and that started as a meme. Mm -hmm. um, but in the, in the movement to sort of, what, what we're trying to do with police reform, um, it, it just made sense, and some of the things that we're asking. So I think that they're, I'm, I'm really encouraged by what the artists are doing with activism, that, they're, that they are doing what Nina Simone asked us to do, is reflect the times that you live in. And also that um, because there's, we're in a moment where we're spending so much time alone and in home studios, so there's a lot of um, direct production to release that doesn't involve a middleman now. So artists are putting out stuff with no obstruction. And I like that that's going on and I like that uh, people are working together um, that are connecting through social media um, for change and also using music to do it uh, and going, you know, doing it sort of DIY, which I love because I love, I love indie artists. So to see them thrive in this moment is, has been really rewarding. And I'm anxious to see what comes out of this, not just musically, um, but creatively for film and television. How are we going to tailor episodes mm. of television and film towards this movement? And to that end, which songs are going to make sense um, for this moment. So, so uh, I'm excited to see what comes comes out on the other side of this. Uh, yeah, uh, Barry, same question for you. Um, I, I, yeah, I think it was this period of time, and COVID definitely is unlike anything I've experienced in my life. But I think it was this cycle where I was, I finally put the dots together between protest songs of the 60s and then fight the power and then all right and like it was like wait a minute throughout way too much time artists have had to reflect and express what's in the hearts of you know millions of individuals who feel repressed or oppressed in some way and i it's so important and it's so vital that it's almost like air. We almost do expect that if there's a hard time, artists are going to internalize that and they're going to express it in some way. And it's going, it may not hit with everybody, but it's going to resonate with some people. And now I think is just as important a time. And the thing that's different now between the civil rights movement of the 60s and what we've been fighting and marching for for all this time is, yeah, the cameras are on, the tools are in the hands of the people. You don't have to go to a recording studio. You don't have to go to an edit suite to create a really compelling and high impact piece of content. And I think it's that kind of inspiration that also makes me, um, you know, it's like I'm just as uncomfortable as everybody else right now, but there is optimism that I feel through our artists and through the expression that's happening now. Uh, I want to just quickly wrap up with some um, some predictions. Um, when do we come out of this? Uh, where does the industry go from here? When do things? Uh, when do we predict things get back to normal? And if they don't anytime soon, what does that look like from a content standpoint and from a production standpoint? How do we adjust? Uh, how do production companies adjust? And, and what type of, of content are they going to have to create? And um, what impact does that have on um, on the music industry as well? Jen, we were 
uh, we were kind of talking a little bit earlier before we uh, started recording here uh, a l- little bit about that. And you were kind of mentioning there was a, um, a producer that you work with uh, who was creating some inter- interesting content, uh, kind of given the con- current constraints of, of COVID. Yeah, I, the Malcolm and Marie. Yes. Yeah, uh, I mean the 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 like lo- the list of everything that had to be done as far as you know the actors miking themselves and taking care of their own costumes and it, it's just it's it's intense. I ho- I hope it doesn't affect our music budgets um, because somebody has to pay for all of the tests and all the people that have to administer the COVID test and where are we gonna even get these tests? So I, I don't know, my, my answer is straight up and I, it could be because it's a Thursday and yesterday was a good day and today is whatever. It's like, I have no idea. I have, I have no idea. Um, but whatever I can do to support the people that figure it out that are a lot smarter than me I don't know. I, I, I don't know the answer. That's a, that's a very honest answer. Uh, and it's greatly appreciated. Um, I do want to just interject a bit of potential hope and optimism here and, uh, and anyone, you know, can feel free to kind of take this and, and run with it. But on, on our end as a music distributor who has such a, you know, large and kind of growing platform, uh, with so many really great kind of emerging artists, uh, kind of signing up to, uh, to your point earlier, Morgan, kind of, DIY release music uh, completely independently and, and on on their own and retain you know 100 percent of all the rights to their own music um we are definitely seeing artists rise to the occasion and um really uh you know kind of uh get in back in the studio um and rededicate themselves to producing uh, really really great music and i think if there's one silver lining out of all of this, my prediction is that um, you know we're just going to see a ton, a ton of really, really great new music that's being created during this this time period. Um, and then hopefully, you know, when I mean, this has kind of been my whole thing of listening to the independent artists, or again, like more of the 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 crate type artists. Is I, I wish I had a place to put it so that even you know more people can hear it and, and get the goose and have that goosebump feeling. And, and I, you know, sorry, I guess I'm not having a good day today. <laughs> this, this is my down day. I'm sorry. I don't want to sound discouraging, but, um, but yeah, I mean, as long as the artists do keep putting the music out, we will catch up and have there will be a lot of content, you know, even being created now, writers' rooms and, uh, you know, on the business end, the Hollywood business end, you know, people making deals and all of that. Um, when we'll, when we come out of this, hopefully there will be so much content that all of the, you know, that will need a lot of great music. Absolutely. Um, before we wrap up, any else want to want to chime in? Any other any other thoughts? I mean, I'll just say I'm kind of looking forward to the next stage of how we work and when we work because there is all this new content. There has been time to give attention to music that you may have received and didn't have a place to put it. And there's this part of me, and I was having this conversation with somebody yesterday. And they were sort of saying, like, what are you going to do when you go back to work and you got to start licensing music? Excuse my French. And I was like, fuck it. I'm going to spread the wealth. I am going to try and, like, not blow my budget, you know. And I'd seen on your pre-questions, like, about big songs, like not being able to afford a big song. That's not even on my plate right now. I am looking to cut the pie into as many pieces as I can because I love my job and second to loving my job is I love creators of music. And if I can like, if it means you got gas in your van or it means you pay your rent or you get the new microphone you want, I would rather give the money to you for that 
then it get clogged up in a big corporation and that artist will never even see it. So I'm going to spread the wealth. I'm going to go look for whoever needs the money. You want to work with me? You want to figure out something fair? That's what I'm going to do. That's all. I mean, it's really, it's really simple. Like we have an obligation to pay it forward. Right. I'm going to pay it forward with someone else's money. That simple. And on that note, I think, uh, <laughs> I think that's a great note to end on. I think we'll leave it right there. Madonna Wade Reed, Morgan Rhodes, Jen Malone, Barry Cole. Uh, you've been so gener generous with your time today. Thank you guys Thank so you. much for, for doing this. Great to see all of you. Stay yeah. safe. Stay healthy. Hang in there. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll all talk soon. Hopefully, hopefully in person in the not-too-distant future. Yeah. Thanks so much, you guys. All right. Thanks, all right. Thanks guys. Bye.